Hello, welcome to another PGN Dunkley. I'm the horse racing correspondent Anthony Dunkley, and once again delighted to be joined by the maestro, the four times NAPS champion, Paul Jacobs. How's yeah, it going? Is it? I mean, you've been Is that 20 quid? Yeah. I promised them earlier. Nice nice uh, yeah, well, basically, Paul, big weekend of racing. Yeah. Uh, we've got the Peter Moss Chase at Haydock, which is a great li little limited handicap, and of course, we've got the Clarence House at Ascot. Yeah. Cannot wait. Um, which would you like to start with? Let's start with the Peter Marsh because it's going to be really tough ground at Haydock over an extended three miles. The, some seasoned campaigners run there. And I think Sue Smith has basically got this one by the Kahunas here because I think uh, she's got no planning. He's a really versatile individual. Runs off a mark of 147, so needs mm -hmm. to improve what it did last time out. But I think Vintage Star finished second this race last year. is really well handicapped. He's three pound lower than last year when he finished second. And, very similar conditions. I mean, literally, it wasn't raceable at the Lancashire track last year. He's been very lightly raced this season. I think he's been underestimated in the betting. He's nearly a double-figure price. I see that as an each-way bet to nothing. I'm very wary of the two pipe charges. Now, Broadway Buffalo in here, two outings back, literally on the bridle, but didn't reproduce it last time out. And that's because that's the way he is. He is enigmatic. Uh, he's, he, he couldn't set a sort of grandfather clock by him. But he's capable of bouncing back. And coming back to that forward two outings back, if he does, Dunkers, he's got a chance. And Amigo, who David Pipe always thought was a Welsh national horse, I never thought he'd stay three mile and five. It was proven again last time out when he finished eighth in the Welsh national. I think he's got a chance off his current mark of 133. But I'm going to be re I'm going to be desperately, desperately disappointed if Vintage Star, at a price, is not in the frame at the very least, on a track that suits, on the going that suits, a horse that. It's not fully exposed yet, or he's sort of getting there, but off a mark of 137 when he can creep, creep through the field, and I think he's going to be in at the end of the finish, in a race that's very, very competitive, and always is every year. Which is a vintage start, I mean, um, fell and pulled up on his last two starts at the back end of last season. Would you say now is the time to strike with him? I think he was over the top, uh, he had a lot of racing, and this year Sue Smith has been a lot more um, sort of uh, patient with him. And she now knows exactly how to handle this horse. He doesn't stay three mile and five, hence he didn't go for the, the Welsh National. He's a horse that wants a slog over three or an extended three. And he, he's got his perfect conditions here. Everything is hugely in his favour. I think she'll be very disappointed if he doesn't go close. Well, Sue Smith, always a trainer to follow in these kind of races. Uh, we're going to move on to Ascot now for the big one, the Clarence House chase which has only five runners in it but it's competitive as, as any chase you're going to see at the moment uh, grade one of course and the possible return of sprinter sacra who has been declared for the race was two to one last night when when the people were wondering will he will he won't he he's been declared he's going to run touch wood uh, a number of people i know uh, a couple of professionals i know have already laid off because they've backed him basically at two to one he's now into 11 to 10 so I take the chance of whether he wins or not on Saturday. Uh, and that's where if you haven't got an exchange account, you need to because trading is now part and parcel of horse racing. Whether you like exchange betting or not, mm. it's the way we're going in any case. And if you get yourself in a strong position, if time and time again you trade out to that position, long term you will make a profit. Otherwise you're just hoping that the horse is going to win every time. You've got to be savvy about this. Definitely. Uh, Paul, Sprinter Sacra, we obviously haven't seen him for over a year. He'll be 386 days. He's been working well. Um, Garrity's happy with the ground. Nicky Henderson is desperate to run him. Is 11 to 10 value? Well, I think the last comment you made is the most pertinent of all. That Henderson is desperate to run him. He either runs him here, he runs him the game spirit at Newbury, or he runs him over hurdles in some godforsaken event. I don't know what it would be, but there are opportunities for him. Um, and how desperate is Nicky Henderson? He said this morning, we're talking on Thursday morning, that Barry uh, walked the course and Nicky's walked the course, and he said the ground isn't too bad. The ground on Wednesday was described as soft. They had 10 mils of rain overnight, and it's still soft. I don't understand that. Thursday today is going to be dry, Friday mainly dry, but there could be some heavy showers on Saturday. Now, I don't know what you think, though, because... Here's the key. Um, on his very best form, he has at least £18 in hand of his rivals, and perhaps more if they run slightly below form. If Barry Garrity is coming out of Swinley Bottom, going down that run of four fences down the side of the track, and he feels the horse is going well, and he turns for home and he asks him for an effort, and he knows he doesn't want to bottom him out, and he knows he doesn't want him 
to feel any pain of any kind that obviously felt last time at Kenton Park. How far down that well does he go to try and get every ounce of effort out of the horse? Bearing in mind, obviously, they want him to run the Queen Mother. And yet, if they don't find out whether he can go through that pain barrier or not, then they still won't come to a conclusion of whether they should run in the Queen Mother in any case. Now, as far as I'm concerned, by the letter of the law at racing, the jockey has to give the horse every chance of winning. And if Barry is too easy on him, he's going to be in hot yeah. water as well. So he's been a, between a rock and a hard stone here. Um, my heart tells me I want to see him win on the bridle and back to the horse he's going to be. I think the percentage chances he's not going to be the great horse he was. I mean, I think... You know, I could be wrong, and, and racing is all about opinions, but the percentage call is he's not going to be the great champion he was. And therefore, my instinct and my head is telling me is to go with a horse who's tight fit, who likes the ground, and who they found a key to winning. And, I, and that's why I think Twin Lights is very good value at 5-1. to one. Mm. I mean, I, I've always thought for you, I don't know what you think. Again, don't us on this, and I know you're going to give your view in a minute, that Dodge and Bullets was a better horse on better ground, despite winning the Tingle Creek on... In, in fairly deep ground, but it was a weak Tingle Creek. It's been to Sacra's in a different land compared to the rivals here. But I think that Willie Mullins and Paul Tanner was really clever. And he went to Willie Mullins before the last race, which he won at 16-1 to a grade 2. And he said, let's pull him wide. Let's give him a side of his fences. And that's how I think they're going to ride him and ask it. It's a shame French Opera hasn't been uh, declared because he would have been the pace in the race, but I think Grey Gold will be at the pace in the race. Yeah. So I think Paul, taking wide of his rivals, jump from fence to fence, and the one thing this horse does, what he likes is really heavy down. He's a bit inconsistent, I grant you that, and he's a horse sometimes you have to forgive one bad run. I'm not, I've not actually had a bet in the race. I've put Twin Lights up on, on easy odds, but I've not had a bet in the race. I want, I want, to, see, um, um, I want to see the big horse come through the race unscathed. But I think he's. I basically. I just think he's vulnerable. Mm. I completely agree, Paul. I'm. I would say I'm too much of a racing fan to have a bet in this race it's because okay. I couldn't. I couldn't. Well, I. It wouldn't be satisfying making money from Sprinter Sacra not winning, and at the same time, I don't want to lose money on him losing and feel the double kind of heartache of him well, not getting. Well, see, I, I see. I, I know, and you've got a great big car, I know you, you love your horses and your horse racing, but if I saw a betting edge here, I would go in, okay. I would definitely go in, but for me the edge, for me the edge isn't strong enough to jump in. Well to back up your point as yeah. well, how many great horses have come back from, from they say going to stud or, or problems and the first run back they haven't been the finished article, yeah. George Washington yeah. finished fourth in the Queen Anne, we have yeah. to remember, yeah. um, after proving infertile at stud. Al Kazim as well finished fifth in a listed race on his return. I don't. He is. We have to face facts. He's probably not going to be the horse that we all remember. Twin Light. I. I think at five to one is probably the right price. I'm a bit worried about, as you say, how enigmatic he is. Six one pulled up one. Um, and if you're following trends, and that means that he's a good. He has good bounce back ability. Don't like dodging bullets. I don't think. Um, I just don't think he's that good on the ground. Um, and if there's further rain to come, I think that will probably suit Sprinter Sacra unfit more than it would dodging bullets, fully tuned up. Yeah, maybe. Uh, Summersby is a little bit too old for my liking. He ran an absolute cracker in the Tim Greek when I put him up. I'm very happy with that. Six to one is just a bit too short. And Grey Gold, I mean, if he wins, then this race is a joke. So I want Sprinter Sacra to win, and I will tip him. I won't back him because uh, I want to see him come home at the... At the end of it, all right. And uh, if you don't, but remember, you have to remember, Paul. If he doesn't win this, it is not the end of the world. No. It's not nowhere near the end of the world. Say he finishes a well-beaten seven lengths third, mm. he still has the opportunity to come back at Cheltenham on a, a track which he probably is better at. I I just remember when Big Bucks came back and being massively underawed by it all mm. uh, from the machine that we knew. And I know he was two years older than Sprinter Sacker, but. My, it's like almost if you lose someone really close to you, right? Your, your memories of them are being alive. Yeah. And then I've heard so many people, I went to see that person when they were dead, and it was like, I shouldn't have gone to see them. And I know it's hugely out of context, but the comparison there is quite valid in the fact that I remember Big Bucks as being this just totally awesome machine, as I'm sure you do as well. And then maybe I expected too much when he came back. It may not be safe for Sprinter Sacra, but I think the odds are, are it's going to go the whole way. 
Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, yeah. so I'm still going to put him up out of allegiance to him. And if you fancy him, he is a best price 11 to 10 at the moment. Or you can probably find a better price on the day of the race if there is more ground. Please check easy odds. Uh, right, we're going to go on to our reflections in running now. Um, we're going to start with Tidal's baby, Paul. Uh, ran on the 10th of Jan at Lingfield, was 7th of 8 over six furlongs, and you think he needs a bit more. Yeah, he's fallen from 78 down to 68 in the weights, and it was just too fast to run a race for him. It was too sharp, six furlongs. He's, he, he doesn't win very often. He's three from 42 in his career, one from 17 on the old weather. But he is capable of winning out. He'll be dropped another three or four pound. He'll be now in the, the mid to low 60s. And if he gets the run of a race over seven furlongs, I think principally at Lingfield, he will win a race of this ilk. And sometimes these low grade handicaps, it's worth looking at the form and sticking with it and reading into it because you will find a winner. Yeah. That's Tidal's baby. Especially. Um, uh, you're very wary of Kilala Key. Uh, second of four, seven lengths at Huntington. Yeah, and a really good novice herder in his time, of course, he beat, beat that mm -hmm. and at Sandown. And uh, he was eight and eight, sort of, well, he, was, he was just off the, the best horses. He was fourth in the Neptune last year as well. And he's got the scope to make a chaser, but he's just been dire over fences, beaten eight lengths by Puff and Billy at Ascot. was there that day, he didn't jump a fence, and I thought, well, that would bring him on. And then at the half-flat race at Doncaster, where they cut out half the fences, he was, he was beaten 46 lengths by Virat, but he was beaten on the home turn. And I thought, well, three miles was too far, let's give him one more chance. Back to two and a half for Hunterdon, and he was smashed by seventh sky. Mm. I think he's lost his mojo, and I think you have to avoid him at all costs. Yeah, a definite place label, also, if yeah, I ever saw one. Absolutely. Uh, Franco Secret to finish off. Uh, he dead easy to the Lingfield, and then he was uh, beating the neck yesterday at Kempton. He was thundering home off the pace. Uh, he broke poorly as well. Yeah, I think Charles Bishop uh, made a mistake. And Franco's Secret, the one race he's won at, and to be fair, it was under Charles Bishop, was when he literally nutted right way on the line over seven furlongs at Kempton. And if you have a look at the replay of his last race, which I know you've done over eight furlongs at Kenton, I think it's produced too early on the outside. He's mm. seen too much daylight. I would like to see Charles put him in between horses and basically just get his neck in front inside the final 100 yards. I think that's the way they've got to ride him. He's only, he's only exposed, only had seven career races, six on the all weather. He will win again. I think he's gone up two pound up to a mark of uh, 76 for this. He's still capable of winning it. But I wonder, I just wonder whether... A trainer might just say, mm, Peter Hedger might say, mm, I'll, I'll put a senior jockey on board. And of course, the, the, the perfect hold up jockey would be Georgie Baker. But he needs holding up until the last minute. And for that reason, he maybe is a, an in play horse. Mm. For, a, for a lower grade horse, um, I, think, I think that race was, that race was uh, pretty strong for the grade. Yeah, um, so I, would, I definitely followed that race. Uh, Gracious George winning the race at Kempton. That is PJ and Dunkley for another week. Next week, we're going to be talking about the Irish champion level and can the fly make more, even more history? Um, early thoughts suggest I think he can because this is going to be his cup final. So, oh, um, actually, and I've had a tirade on Twitter as well. You have indeed. With a few people are, are saying that Hurricane Fly is unbelievable value for the champion hurdle in no. 14 to 1. Um, the very fact of the matter is that if you have a look through his form, I mean, Leopardstown is like a home game for him, and Cheltenham is like playing away from home in East of Europe for a football team. And if it's good ground at Cheltenham, you, you might as well have fourteen hundred to one. He can't, he won't win, and he can't win the champion hurdle in what promises to be a really good year. The champion hurdle, as well. definitely. When you heard it here first, uh, Paul's going to give anyone fourteen hundred to one if they fancy Hurricane Fly for the champion hurdle. Uh, join us next week.